This is a podcast of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. To learn more about how you can support Scripps, visit us online at scripps.ucsd.edu. Global warming is not the only consequence of our fossil fuel use. While nearly half the carbon dioxide produced by humans remains in the atmosphere, the oceans absorb about a third. There, researchers like marine biologist Victoria Fabry and marine chemist Andrew Dixon are discovering a new problem that threatens entire marine ecosystems. Scientists call ocean acidification the other CO2 problem. Ocean acidification has, in fact, been called the other CO2 problem, where uh, people are very much aware, I, I think, that if you put CO2 in the atmosphere, it causes global warming. But another problem is also ocean acidification. When you put CO2 into the ocean, it lowers the pH of, this, of the seawater, and it also decreases the carbonate ion concentration, which is an important building block in the shells and calcium carbonate skeletons of many different organisms. Once it was really apparent that CO2 was increasing in the atmosphere, and this is really work made uh, clear by the work of Charles David Keeling here at Scripps, he also pointed out that of the total amount of CO2 that was being produced by burning fossil fuels, only about 40% was remaining in the atmosphere. The rest was going somewhere else, the oceans, land plants. People realized that if it was going to dissolve in the oceans, it was going to have these chemical changes. The first papers I saw discussing this were published in about 1973. But at that time, people did not see this as a problem where the concentration of carbonate ion mattered directly. What they saw was that if you got to a certain level, where calcium carbonate would start to dissolve, that is the carbonate ion concentration was so low that the mineral would dissolve, then it would be a problem. And if it was above that, then it wouldn't be a problem. That's how people viewed it. We've come to realize, and this is through experiments that started in the 1990s and through the years of this century, that in actual fact, these effects are, are gradual. That is, if you reduce the carbonate ion concentration, there is an effect even though you haven't yet got to the low levels that would be required to have calcium carbonate dissolve. Scripps scientists are using the data plotted in the famous Keeling curve and the rich archives of ocean data collected by the institution to put the problem of ocean acidification in context. Other key resources are the samples of ocean water prepared in Dixon's lab that have helped to create over the past 20 years the reference standard for measurement of carbon dioxide and alkalinity levels in seawater. Today, Dixon's lab bottles about 4,500 samples a year for distribution to labs around the world. Scripps is emerging as a center of ocean acidification study by drawing on the expertise of scientists in several disciplines. Last November, Scripps physical oceanographer Uwe Send and Scripps biological oceanographer Mark Oman joined a variety of collaborators, including scientists from NOAA, to add carbon dioxide sensors to moorings deployed off the Southern California coast. There are plans to deploy two more moorings this year in San Diego and near the California-Oregon border and to launch lab experiments to observe how rising acidity affects the development of shelled organisms. This is a very interdisciplinary problem, the issue of ocean acidification. It involves biology from molecular and genomic uh, techniques and scales all the way to ecosystems. And it involves, of course, uh, the chemistry, physical environment, and modeling. And all of that uh, comes together here at Scripps. The problem of ocean acidification is uh, a very large one because it involves climate in climate impacts on the ocean environment on a very large scale. It requires interdisciplinary research drawing on the expertise of different groups of people. The Mooring Project, uh, coordinated by myself and Uwe Send with the collaborations of many other uh, colleagues, is one element. This is the observational ocean element of an ocean acidification research program. Other kinds of, of research that are needed uh, involved laboratory experimental work where we very carefully control the environment 
and look at the rates of calcification and growth of, of calcifying organisms and a variety of different model efforts, uh, mathematical models, to project the future state of the system in time. So we're, we're contributing the in situ ocean measurement side to this complementary effort. Much more research is needed to know when, where, and to what extent acidification trends will affect ocean waters. But the indications researchers have observed suggest we cannot allow a generation to pass before deciding what needs to be done. It takes about a thousand years or more, a few thousand years for things to return back to how they were before we put the CO2 in, even if we removed all the CO2 from the atmosphere that we've put in extra, it would still take a few thousand years because the oceans only mix slowly. It's as though you imagine a cup of tea and it's being stirred once every thousand years. Some of the big unknowns with ocean acidification is will organisms adapt or not? And in some, some of them probably will adapt, but others may in fact not have time. The conditions are changing so rapidly. That is a, a key point with ocean acidification. Humans are uh, increasing the atmospheric CO2 concentration at such a rapid rate. It doesn't give many organisms time to adapt, particularly in the high latitudes where uh, they can face corrosive uh, conditions in a matter of decades, or even along our coast. We simply don't know at this point. It's a big unknown. This has been a presentation of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego.